Hi, everyone. This is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery. And I'm excited to have Eric Su, who's an investor, founder, and advisor to companies. He's the chairman of the digital marketing agency, Single Grain, which has worked with companies such as Amazon, Uber, and Salesforce. He also hosts two podcasts, which is Marketing School with Neil Patel and Leveling Up, an entrepreneurial podcast where he discusses uh, where he dissects growth levels that help businesses grow. Uh, he's the author of the new book, Leveling Up, How to Master the Game of Life. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me, Rohit. Yeah, uh, Eric, I've been a big fan of yours. I've listened to both of your podcasts and, uh, you know, it's finally good to, good to finally uh, meet you uh, and have you on the show. Uh, you know, uh, let's talk about how did you get interested into entrepreneurship and how did that interest in gaming happen when you, when you started? Yeah, I mean, you know, entrepreneurship, I kind of lucked into it and I kind of leveled my way up there. Um, and there, there's a lot of, there's levels to everything at the end of the day. Um, and so for me, the only thing I was really good at growing up was playing games. So from about age eight or nine years old to about 22, um, the only thing I excelled at was games. And, and thankfully, there's I, I played at a high level where I was playing with great teams. And so in, in life and business, you have to play with great teams. Um, I learned the value of you know teamwork. I learned the value of communication, of resilience. I learned from different games, whether it's poker, strategy games, first person shooter games. Um, you know, I really wanted to play it at a high level. And to do that, again, you had to be part of a great team, right? So uh, I learned that at an early age. I just never knew that I'd be able to apply it to real life. And uh, I just knew that, you know, at an early age that if I could just wake up and find the right game um, where, you know, I, I could just find recapture the same excitement I had every day waking up to play a game, I would be set for life. And I had no idea that it's just basically reframing life into a game and treating it that way. And um, just treating it as an infinite game that will never end and just playing it for the long term, you know, that, that basically settles everything, right? The way when you reframe how you think about it, it's just like, oh, this is it. Life is game. Let's just play until we die. And then that's it. And so I think it's important for people, um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that are not happy right now. They're suffering right now. It's, you know, they're looking at things as good or bad, right? And it's, they might be looking at things more bad right now. But I think reframing that, understand that, you know, maybe the things that are happening are not good or bad. It's just, it is what it is. And what are you going to do to change it? Right. So anybody that is playing basketball, you know, you're, you're, you're constantly improving your shot. Um, now, if you're playing tennis, you're improving your swing. Right. But in, in business or in marketing, you're constantly making iterations there as well. And you're just adjusting. If it's, if it is what it is right now, if you're not at the level that you want to be, you just have to beat the current level and then you get to, you get to the next level, but you don't deserve to go to the next level until you beat the current one. Very interesting. And, and you talked about infinite games. I, I really like that concept. I think there's a book about infinite games and finite games. I think uh, I've, I've uh, looked at uh, playing an infinite games, uh, you know, as, as I, I'm getting older and advisor. And, uh, you know, in, in the book, you talk about the concepts of power ups, which is education, love, food, uh, competition. You also talked about, uh, you know, uh, you, you have four pillars, which is health, uh, family, friends and work. Uh, you know, how, how, how does one look at the concepts and power ups and how do you build your personal modes? Yeah, I mean, I think the personal mode is really just your story, right? And so for me, my story is nothing unique. I'm one of the 3 billion people in the world that have played a game. Um, what's unique is my, my intersection with other stuff. So I have a big interest in marketing. I love learning. I love teaching. Oh, so it seems very, it, it seems to make sense that I help level up the world with marketing, right? And that's why I have marketing businesses. My audience continues to grow that way. But, um, you know, that's what it is. That's why the, the book is really the intersection of the gaming and kind of the business stuff that I do right now. Um, and everyone has their own little intersection. They all have, you know, different variables that make them unique. It's just, you know, and I think, um, you know, you get to a certain point where you're going to have a message, right? And maybe if you don't have a message, it just means you need to develop more to get to the point where you really have something to say. And that's what a book is. You're here to just spread a message. Right. And, uh, you know, before we, we dive into your businesses, uh, you've been part of a treehouse. I was a big fan of, of the company and Ryan Carson was the founder. Now, how did you get your start into, into a uh, treehouse and how did you become, uh, you know, VPS at a young age? Yeah. I mean, I, I got lucky. I, I mean, I, I lucked into these things, right? So there's, there's levels to everything. Cause when I was interviewing for this role, um, I really demonstrated my passion. I watched all of Ryan's interviews and I said, hey, this is what I'm interested in. I think this is the future. Um, education is, is really important to me. Um, and I told him exactly what I would do with the website. And I was competing with other CMO level people, other people that have been VPs. Whereas I, at age 25, when I was interviewing, 
I had no management experience. I had a lot of, I just lacked a ton of experience, but I was very hungry and he took a shot on me. Um, and you know, that's what happened. And, uh, fortunately it worked out, but it almost didn't work out a month into the job. He almost fired me, um, because the company was actually in dire straits, which I had no idea about, but, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about that, but, um, basically, you know, once I got the job too, there's levels within how I interviewed there, right. I did a lot of studying. Then when I got the job, I had to also understand, I had, I had to study how to manage. I had to understand how to build rapport with people. I had to understand culture. I had to understand how to hire. Um, I had to understand how to fire people too. And so, you know, I just constantly got a little bit stronger every single day, just 1% better every single day. And um, that's how I learned. Just like with, with single grain, when I took it over, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I made it go from bad to worse. We dropped all the way down to one employee and my outside accounting firm called me and said, it might be time to shut it down. So look, I, I think it's just a lot of pain and learning. Got it. And, uh, you, you know, you talked about your diamond tree house, uh, uh, what what changes did you make? Uh, you you got uh, you are you understood about YouTube ads and video marketing, uh, but but what really helped uh, grow more signups and did better marketing for Treehouse? I mean that one was easy. I mean you know my the CEO Ryan said you know we're gonna have to fire you if you don't hit numbers this month. And there's 80 people's families riding on your shoulders. And I looked at. I had shut all the ads down previously because um, my, my predecessor was running things and he left because he was really disappointed that, you know, this 25 year old kid um, basically took the job he was trying to get. Right. And um, you know, I looked at the, the ad account and it seemed that YouTube ads was actually performing. And so look, if you're going to say you're going to fire me in a month, then, okay, well, either I can cry about it or I can do something about it and seem like this was, it, this was a no brainer bet. I don't know why we shut it off in the first place. So I bet the entire company on YouTube advertising. And fortunately it went well. I mean, we were acquiring about 300, 400 users at the time, but when I added in YouTube ads, we went from 300 to 1500 to 3,500 to I think 5,500 a month. So excuse me, it, it just continued to grow. Interesting. And, um, you know, after, after you moved out of Treehouse, you, you bought a failing uh, SEO agency uh, for $2. How, how did that happen? And what were your thoughts behind that? And I think that moved on to become single green. Yeah. I mean, my podcast partner, Neil Patel was actually a partner in the agency and he said, Hey, come help save this company. Cause you kind of helped this other company. You kind of helped turn it around. Why don't you come help save this one? And, um, I said, I'm a, I'm not that interested in agencies. You know, it's not a very scalable business model, but I, th I think that the challenge in my mind was, wow, if I can save this business, I can do anything because it was a failing SEO agency. The work we were doing didn't matter anymore. It didn't work because Google invalidated the work from their, from, the, from their algorithm. So I had the chance now to potentially run a company, right. Without taking on much risk from my side. So I'm like, I'm going to learn a lot. And so, uh, you know, I came in as a number two, the COO and um, you know, six months into the job, the four other partners decided that they wanted out. And Neil even told me to get out. He said, there's nothing here. There's no brand equity. There's nothing as a friend, you should get out. And I said, Hey, why don't I give it a shot? And so I bought his shares $1 for 10%, another dollar for another 10%. And the rest were basically seller finance um, through the company, through the profits of the company. And I put in a contingency. I was 27 years old, right? I was doing my first M&A deal. And I'm air quoting for those of you that can't see, cause I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and, you know, I, I basically put in a contingency saying if the company failed, I would owe nothing. Now, this ties back directly in with my gaming days because I played a lot of poker. And to me, this was asymmetric upside, meaning that if I won, if it worked, I would have unlimited upside and I can take the cash flows and go reinvest it in other exponential or more durable sources of income. And if I failed, it would be my MBA. I would learn a lot and I really wouldn't lose a lot. So heads I win, tails I still win. Very, very interesting. You know, you talk about uh, taking asymmetric bets. Uh, it remind me of, of of the tweet from Naval Ravikant. Are there, are there other asymmetric bets would you uh, would tell to uh, you know young hustlers who are trying to trying to build their own startups? Uh, do you do you think uh, you know investing into Bitcoin, uh, investing into startups, or doing a startup uh, are the all asymmetric bets which one should take into their twenties? I think investing. I mean, this is not investment advice. This is just for entertainment purposes only. But um, really investing into anything, you have to have, you know, Naval Ravikant, I'm sure there's fans of Naval in here, 
um, you have to have equity and stuff, whether it's equity in business, equity in stocks, equity in crypto, you have to have equity and then it can compound over time. Um, then you have your money, you know, work for you while you sleep. And, um, you know, that, that's what it is at the end of the day. I think um, if we're looking at investing in things, you know, Naval himself has said there's four forms of leverage. You have code, capital, labor, and media. Um, and so, you know, you have to figure out what makes the most sense for you to start building first um, and, and go from there. I, <clears throat> what I did stupidly with single grain was I tried to build media the same time that I was trying to save the company. Um, and so it, it actually took a lot of my attention away, but fortunately it all worked out. But if I were to go back in time, um, I would not do that because it was actually very painful. So I think focusing is one thing. And then, you know, at least for me, I like investing in businesses because I get a lot of leverage with, I get the code, I get the capital, and sometimes I might get the media, I get the labor as well. Right. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, looking at crypto, it, it makes a lot of sense to me, right. It's not investment advice, um, but it is what it is. And here's the thing. If, if let's say I invested everything into crypto, 100%, right? Um, the, the good news is you want to become so good to the point where you know if you lose all that money, you're going to go out there and you're going to rebuild, right? Because you know how to make money already. Like you want to get to that point where it's like, okay, whatever, right? Because at the end of the day, making money is just adding value to the world. Right, absolutely. And um, uh, Eric, if you could go back, would you, work, would you focus on the podcast or do you focus on this on single grain? I focus on single grain. Okay. Okay. Got it. And, um, you know, I've, I've been into SaaS businesses. I've worked as a, as a, uh, yeah, as a partnership business development roles, but, you know, payback time for, for SaaS companies takes, takes much longer, but, uh, in your view, what is the difference between a seven figure and a nine figure business? What, what is it that differentiates a seven figure business to a nine figure business? Yeah. I mean, seven figures, you know, you can, that's something you can lock into. Um, and that's not to take away any of the hard work, but you know, a lot of, you can just, you know, you can get very fortunate and then you can kind of uh, build it into seven figures. So seven figures is really, it's $83,000 a month. And if you have, you know, 10 clients paying you 10 grand a month, you're already there. Right. Um, you don't need a lot of process tied to it. It could just be you serving the customers. It could just be a one man show. And there's a lot of, you know, one man, seven figure businesses, which is great. Um, but if we're talking about getting to eight figures to nine figures, you know, to eight figures, we're talking about process, right? We're talking about process. We're talking about systematizing things. Um, and we're all, we're talking about also hiring, you know, a, a good team, right? Um, now, when we think about um, nine figures, we're thinking about, okay, now you have to have a super experienced executive team, okay? Um, that has been there. They've done that. Um, and then you also have, a, you have to have a really good culture too, because culture is the operating system and your communication has to be tip top. Right. And so I, I've seen the same thing, you know, nine figures plus it's, it's basically that right at the end of the day, it's who can you hire um, eight figures. Again, you're processizing, you're, you're systematizing things. You have a pretty good team. Um, maybe these are people that have, you know, uh, people that have potential. Right. Um, and these people, some of them can rise up to, you know, being super senior, but oftentimes, you know, you're going to find that trying to promote people into roles that are high risk typically doesn't work out. Um, maybe it works out. I don't know, maybe 20, 30% of the time. But for me, it hasn't worked out as much. I'll tell you that much. And I, I typically try to promote people for potential. Just keep in mind, just a little lesson for me. Um, if it's a super senior, high risk role, you want to go for someone that's done it before. Got it. And, uh, 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 you know, what advice would you give to founders who are looking to, uh, to uh, increase their, you know, lifetime value of, of the customer? Uh, or do you think it's uh, is as simple as increasing the, the prices uh, or, or, or of the SaaS product or the consumer product? Yeah. I mean, you know, you can definitely increase your pricing. I mean, that's one of the highest levers you can pull, or you could do a lot better with your, your customer success, you know, reaching out to people asking, Hey, what else can I do? You can upsell, you can cross sell to increase the lifetime value. Um, and you could also do a better job just listening to customers, figuring out what their frustrations are to bring your churn rate down. Right. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, subscription is all about churn rate. It's all about retention. Um, you know, what other things can you add on um, to just keep people make things sticky. Right. And so, for example, if you're a web design firm and you just build websites and then they're all one-off projects, can you go buy another agency and uh, add in, you know, paid media services or social media services where you have recurring income coming in? That way, they're going to be a lot more sticky. Um, how do you build a long-term relationship with your customers? How do you actually become friends with your customers and then do more for them? How do you listen to them, find out what they're interested in, right? Um, and then, you know, ultimately try to create this five-star experience for them. 
Got it. And, um, you, know, you know, I've been a big fan of, uh, you know, growth everywhere and, and marketing school. Uh, you did point out in your podcast that you, you had very low downloads in the first initial uh, year or so, I think, uh, close to 90, 90 downloads per, per episode. Uh, and, you know, I've been part of this uh, this community called On Deck, uh, where I'm trying, trying the community of people who, who are trying to build podcasts. I think there should be more people to uh, looking to create, uh, creating content and all. But how do you, how do, what advice would you give to people who, who've been creating content, but they are looking at increasing downloads? Uh, what, what would be your advice uh, uh, to, to improve the, the conversion rates? I mean, well, I think you're talking about downloads or conversion rates. Uh, sorry, downloads. About. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, look, so I have this turtle in front of me. Okay. The, the reason I have a turtle is because I, I talk fast. I type fast. It's, I do a lot of things fast and this turtle reminds me to slow down. And, you know, when I think about the podcast or anything, really two to three years is really the typical time it, it takes for something to work, whether it is a business or whether it is you're trying to build an audience. So after the first year of leveling up, I was only getting nine downloads a day. After the second year, I was only getting 30 downloads a day. And, but if I stopped, I wouldn't have been able to get to kind of where we are today. Well, cumulatively, we're about 50 million downloads or so. Oh. And that it takes time to compound. It's like any type of investing. It's like any type of relationship. It takes time to build up. And people are, I would say, selfish. And what I mean by that is you're so selfish that all you think about are your number of downloads when you should be looking at something else. So I reframed my mindset into thinking about, okay, I shouldn't be focused on the downloads. I should be focused on the relationships I'm building, which are infinitely more valuable and the learnings I was getting. So I was trying to save single grain at the same time. So I was asking a lot of selfish questions to help me save the business. And, you know, they were kind of guiding me in the right way. Um, they didn't know they were guiding me, but, but they were guiding me. And so my KPI was not downloads. My key performance indicator was my rate of learning. Was that increasing or not? So I think it's important to know what you're, what you're aiming for. Um, but look, even with our, our blog, I mean, you know, first when I took over single ring, we had like 3000 visits a month. Now we're at about 350,000, which is, it's not the most in the world, but it's, it's good. Um, our YouTube, you know, three years ago, it was maybe 2000 subscribers or so. Now it's at 54,000, right? Um, again, we haven't done the best job with YouTube. Like we're, we're still improving at it, but you can see it's compounded. So it's compound interest. It's sticking with it. It's staying consistent. Um, and it's a boring answer, but that's exactly what it is. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, like, uh, I like what you said about the KPI being a uh, ra rate of learning and uh, building relationships, because I think uh, that has also been my mantra, uh, uh, but, but hopefully, you know, uh, it's going to compound and the downloads are going to improve. And, uh, you, you know, since you mentioned that you you stay in your in your lane which is which is marketing and content marketing uh, uh, this is for, this is for founders and marketers how how do you look at uh, the roi for content marketing uh, because it's easy to look at paid ads and see what is the roi there but how how do you, how do you judge what is the uh, roi for content marketing yeah i mean Look, you, you can measure MQL, so marketing qualified leads. Um, so, you know, not only are you getting leads, but are they marketing qualified? And then you have sales qualified leads. Um, you know, but ultimately at, at the end of the day though, you know, I'm, I'm looking to, if I'm creating content, I'm looking for reach, right? So same for social media content, same for um, SDO, I'm looking for more organic traffic. And then obviously I want to pair that with another metric to see, you know, what my lead conversion rate is, right? So I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, content, the reach, and then the conversion rate. Got it. And um, no, uh, uh, you've been, uh, you know, running two podcasts and uh, agency and also uh, you're part of a company called ClickFlow. Uh, how, how do you manage the workload so that you are able to manage, uh, you know, different companies because you also invest on, into a lot of other businesses. Uh, how do you, what is the mental framework you have to, to manage all these things at the same time? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's hiring amazing people and, and having them run it, right? So we have an operator that runs ClickFlow. We have an operator for all these other things. We have an operator for the events business that I do with Neil. We have a book we have a book launch team and we, we've hired people to help with the book too. Um, there's just a lot of elements where we just have leaders that run it. And ultimately, you know, all I do is, is, is create content now and help recruit people and, you know, try to do deals as well, which, which might also bring us uh, more people as well. Got it. And... Uh... 
you know, 2002 or uh, 20 uh, was an inflection point where, where most of the companies had to be remote. Um, how do you maintain the productivity for, for a remote team and for, for yourself also? What are the, some of the tools which you would suggest uh, uh, to, uh, to be more productive? Well, I mean, you know, the good thing for us is that we started, uh, we were already remote. We were already uh, three days in the office, two days remote. So people were used to working remote already because we, we already had that model before. Like, and I'm pretty sure the future is going to be maybe two days or three days in the office and then two days yeah. work remote. Um, and so we had that already and we had a lot of the tools. So um, you can use Slack. Um, we use Slack for work, but I use Discord for our leveling up community. I, I actually like Discord more. Um, and we use Zoom. And in America, we use Gusto for our payroll. And, um, you know, those are kind of the, we have, we use Google Suites as well. And, um, you know, we, we use another tool called Bonusly, which allows us to kind of um, award people uh, gifts, right? So you get points and then you can use those points to redeem Amazon gift cards and things like that. But those are kind of the core Just tools that we're using every single day. Got it. And, uh, you know, uh, since you run a, run a famous podcast and you're doing uh, other things, uh, what made you uh, write the book, uh, Leveling Up? Uh, what, what is the aim behind writing the book? Yeah. So what I said earlier was about if you have a message, then it's worth writing a book. I think writing a book just to write a book to try to get leads or something like that, at least to me, that's not a good enough reason. I, I could have definitely written a book about marketing school and, uh, you know, who knows, I might do it in the future, but this speaks to me a lot more because again, age, age eight to 22 years old, that's a very long time. This is how I'm programmed. This is how I'm wired. And you have 3 billion people in the world that have played a game before. And I think it's important for them to understand that everything they learn, they can make a big difference in the world. They, they can make a big impact because, you know, for me, I was the ultimate failure growing up. And if I can make it happen, I think anybody can make it happen. And again, I'm just starting right now, right? For me, I'm still, um, you know, when I think about Gary Vee, he really started putting out content when he was 34. Guess what? I'm 34 right now. And so like, you know, I, I think, by the way, you don't need to compare yourself to other people. Um, I think it's just, it is what it is right now. And it's going to take time to compound. And I'm totally fine with that. But I think we talked about how important it is to create um, you know, media, right? And I think one of the biggest forms of leverage is having a community. So, you know, if the book does what I think it will do, which is build a large community around it, um, to be able to have these people, um, you know, themselves make a bigger impact on the world, I think that's going to be great. And, um, you know, if they want to, you know, build great habits, this is the book for it. Um, but again, you know, life is ultimately a game. And I think everyone should understand that. And if you look at it that way as a game that will never end, then um, you're going to enjoy life a lot more. Uh, interesting. And, uh, you know, what was the process for writing the book? Because, you know, you're doing uh, so many th uh, different things and, uh, and you know, what did you do for, for launching the book? Are there any strategies which you used to, uh, to launch it? Yeah. I mean, so the book's not out yet. It's out next week, but as an example, we're doing a, a podcast right now. So I I've been doing a crazy podcast tour. I've been doing a lot of clubhouse, um, you know, growing there as well. And, um, you know, we're doing a, we, if you go to levelingup.com slash bulk, we have bulk orders where you can order, you know, 30 or a hundred copies or so. And you can either go all the way up to, you know, um, the highest package, which, which is hanging out with Neil and myself in, in real life. So we have bulk orders as well. That helps with our scans. Um, we hit our email list, you know, all our social channels. And um, those are kind of the main things that we do. And, um, you know, eventually we'll do something after the launch, which is going to be tied more to a book funnel. And what was the process of writing a book? Did you did you make sure that you would write an X number of words every day? And did you have an editor nope. who? Um, I it took me so, you know, it took me about five to six years to write the book. And some people have told me like it'll take five to six years to write a book. Um, nice. But keep in mind, I was doing it on and off. So as I was doing it on and off through the years, I was gaining more and more experience. And there would be certain items or readings that I would like to pull in or experience I'd like to pull in from different areas. And it actually bolstered and supported the book quite a bit. Um, we did have multiple editors um, just to get different eyes on it. And I did have to basically um, re-edit the book seven times. So, you know, all the things they told me, it takes five to six years. It's going to be seven edits. It basically, those two things were true. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, since uh, uh, I, uh, you know, had the, had the privilege to read the book. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting things you talk about is uh, where, where one of your mentors talked about never peak. And, you know, uh, what happens is that you know, there are times when you uh, when you are not able to level up. Uh, you know, what, what are some of the, because you, you know, you interview uh, high quality entrepreneurs, what what strategy would you tell to people on, uh, on 
or to always level up and always uh you know power up in life yeah i mean so the reason the book's called leveling up and not level up is because you're constantly trying to get one percent better every day and you know if you're failing at something or if you feel like there's a setback that's a prerequisite to get to you know the next level right it's it's you know how are you going to deal with it it is what it is right now how are you going to deal with it what are you going to do um and so that's that's up to you and you know for me i've reframed it like uh, i you know, when, when I feel there's an obstacle or if there's pain or someone, you know, um, someone says something bad about me or someone, um, you know, kind of slights me, like I don't get angry about it uh, per se, um, but I, I do take that as fuel and I use it as motivation to get even stronger. So the way I look at it now is, is, is give me more, give me more pain, um, not physical pain, but give me more psychological pain because I know that's a piece that's going to make me stronger. Um, and so, you know, that's what works for me. It might not work for a lot of people, but um, just keep in mind, everyone is different. And uh, you know, also, also in the book, you talk about uh, you know a uh, 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 lot of lot of great uh, entrepreneurs and great marketers. Uh, sometimes they they look at stealing ideas. Uh, but uh, you know what? Uh, how how do you process uh, ideas and and marketing uh, ideas when you when you look at uh, other companies and other uh, uh, people uh, using that in their own business? Yeah, I mean, look, you're, you're, we're constantly learning, we're constantly copying, we're constantly iterating from each other. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's um, just understanding that nothing in life is really that original. You know, Steve Jobs said that everything in life is a remix, right? The mouse right. that I have in front of me, he stole it from Xerox. The GUI, he stole from Xerox. SpaceX's rockets, you know, they look fundamentally the same as old rockets, but they come back to Earth. That's a big difference. But um, we're all just iterating. We're all just building on the shoulder of, shoulders of Titans. There's nothing wrong with ethically stealing from other people because that's basically what we're doing right and uh you know you've also been part of part of masterminds and and communities like entrepreneurs organization uh, how how important is is such communities and such organizations and uh you know are there any examples which you would advise to people to be part of such uh, such communities yeah, I mean, I'm in YPO. I, I'm in EO. So Young Presidents Organization, uh, Entrepreneurs Organization, they have different revenue requirements and they'll verify your, your income um, or the, the valuation of your business. And um, those are great. You know, Neil and I, we have our own peer group that we do. Um, but you can tell like community is very important to me. And that's why I'm trying to build a new community with, with leveling up. It's just connecting people and then letting them kind of flourish. Um, that goes a long way. You want to ultimately be the host where you can kind of, um, you know, make sure people get what they need and kind of, you know, um, influence the content. And um, yeah, exactly. We're, we're creating a movement with leveling up and we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Uh, Eric, I quickly want to do a top three. What's your favorite business book? Yeah. Favorite business book would probably be the hard thing about hard things. Love that book. And, uh, you know, if you could go back in time when you started uh, your business, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently? Yeah, I would have focused on one business. <laughs> Got it. And uh, what's your favorite online tool, for example, Gmail, Slack, Zoom? My favorite online tool? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my favorite online tool right now would be, um, there's a tool called um, conversion.ai and it helps you create content uh, using GPT-3. So you can create content, you can create headlines and things like that. Got it, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, uh, Eric, what is the best way people can reach out to you and know about your book, uh, Leveling Up? Yeah, I mean, look, they can go to levelingup.com um, and they can reach me on Twitter or at Instagram uh, at Eric O-S-I-U. Got it. We will put that in the show notes. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for taking time. I'm a big fan of, uh, of your podcast. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really enjoyed my conversation uh, with you. Thanks for having me.